Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast of the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And today we are talking about the Narrative Lectionary for Maundy Thursday, which is includes the preparations for the Passover and the words of institution. Uh, so once again, I'll oh, go for it. Uh, let's let's start again. Sorry, if you could do, <laughs> if you could just say the chapter and verses too, Christopher. Oh, okay, okay. wonderful. Okay, yep. Okay, so I'll pause again and then we'll start. <laughs> Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast of the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And today we're talking about the narrative lectionary for Maundy Thursday. It's Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 30. And in it, we have the preparation for the Passover, as well as Jesus's prediction of betrayal and the words of institution. Yeah, so um, we're reading from, uh, from Matthew uh, this year. Uh, and so we have uh, the the um, as you as you already said the preparations for the Passover um, the the Last Supper here that is depicted is the Seder meal right uh, mm -hmm. which is not true in John but is true in the Synoptic Gospels right of Matthew Mark and Luke um, and uh, just you know again uh, preachers you might you might um, take the opportunity to connect this. Uh, with what we've been, what we talked about in the fall with uh, uh, in the book of Exodus uh, and talk about the Passover, just remind uh, the uh, your, your congregants about what Passover is, what it means, uh, what it meant to, you know, people in Jesus' time, what it still means to Jews today. So Passover, of course, is the commemoration uh, of the last and terrible plague uh, that, G that, 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 God sends on the Egyptians the death of the firstborn, and the miraculous um, saving of the the Israelites or the Hebrew slaves there, uh, and it's it's celebrated as um, one of the three great pilgrimage festivals in the Jewish calendar. Uh, the other two being Sukkot uh, and uh, and weeks um, or uh, Shavuot. Uh, and be, because it's one of those, one of the big three, um, observant Jews uh, would travel to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate Passover if they could, um, mm -hmm. if they were able to do so. Uh, and so Jesus is among those, Jesus and his disciples are among those. Uh, and, and the central kind of celebration or the central commemoration of Passover is, of course, the Seder meal. So Lots of ritual there, lots of symbolism, the, the unleavened bread, the uh, various cups of wine, the recitation of the uh, uh, the Hallel, the Psalms 113 to 118. We talked a bit about that in the in the podcast for Palm Sunday uh, and and uh, an actual meal uh, together with, um, you know, with your family uh, or extended family or in this case, the disciples, his uh, his friends. Um, and the, yeah, the, the commentary again, um, on the, uh, on the website, um, by Warren is, is a good one. So we commend that to your, uh, to your reading as well. And I think another historical detail to know about the Passover that's going to become very important soon is because it was such a major festival. And because it was a pilgrimage, it meant the population of the city of Jerusalem really swelled during this time. And it made it a very uh, fraught time in terms mm. of the political situation in the city. So one of the things that we see is that the Roman governor of Judea normally would live in Caesarea Maritima, which is a city on the coast. But on account of the political situation, the Passover, he would come and stay in Jerusalem. And we see this later with the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate takes place in Jerusalem because mm -hmm. Pilate has come up for the festival. And so this is a charged atmosphere. We've already seen that with Palm Sunday that we talked about in our last episode and the way in which Palm Sunday is replete with kingship imagery. And 
and the imagery of Jesus's, we've talked about it, it's his triumphal entry already would be something that is, uh, would catch the eye of many people in this sort of mm. circumstance. But we go from that kind of large uh, idea of crowds and the entry to a very intimate setting for this particular passage. And it starts in a, uh, I suppose we should say, a pretty gloomy place, especially considering the triumph of Palm Sunday, because it starts with Jesus's prediction that one of the 12 will betray mm. him. And we see this uh, symbolic gesture of dipping the bread and the bowl together and this idea that even though they share a table together they dip their bread in the same bowl of olive oil or fish sauce or whatever it is even though they're doing that one of these people who shares so intimately in jesus's meals will end up betraying him to the romans and so we start there yeah well, and, and we hear about that betrayal right before uh, our passage begins. So in, uh, in chapter 26, 14 through 16, uh, you know, one of the 12 who is called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. So mm -hmm. that foreboding that we talked about, yeah, in our last um uh, podcast on Palm Sunday uh, comes to uh, reality here, right? That that one of Jesus' own inner circle, one of Jesus' disciples, will betray him, and he knows it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, which of course throws everyone into distress, right? Like, is it I, Lord? Uh, am I uh, am I the one? Uh, surely not, mm -hmm. I, Lord, is is what they say. Um, so it, yeah, that uh, it's not just the Roman imperial power, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's also the uh, the intimate, uh, the the friend, uh, the follower, the disciple uh, who is opposed to Jesus. And exactly. Lots of you know, lots of ink has been spilled. Lots of uh, movies have been made about what uh, you know inspires Judas. Is he? Um, a zealot uh, of some sort who is uh, seeking to provoke Jesus into, you know, leading an armed rebellion, or is he disappointed in Jesus, you know, because he thought he would lead an armed rebellion and he's not? It it never really says, right? What Judas? No, is. it doesn't. And I, I would point out that those are all very modern interpretations. The the medieval and kind of Reformation interpretation of Judas was simply that he was poor and wanted money. Hmm. And that is uh, what marks him as a betrayer. And, you know, there is probably some truth to that as well in the terms of the way in which we know that the disciples were not men of means. And so I think that there is a, an important thing not to get too caught up in, again, this question of why Judas does what he does, because the the Gospels are silent on it. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially the Gospel of Matthew. But I think within that setting, kind of a gloom of foreboding, it's important to remember that that is the setting of the words of institution of mm -hmm. the Last Supper, as the way in which, despite this coming betrayal, that is where we get this great promise of Jesus, this promise of his presence in mm. the bread and the wine. And I think that that could help to put that celebration in a new context, perhaps, for your congregation. We are, and don't get me wrong, I think the celebration imagery that we use around the Lord's Supper is appropriate and is uh, helpful for people. But I also think it's important to know that celebration is not the primary motif here, not the primary feeling as they are. It is one of foreboding and distress, as you've said. Mm. And there are ways in which that, in some ways, is even more powerful to see the way that Jesus meets his disciples in the midst of that foreboding and that distress with this uh, astounding claim that he makes. That's that's really a beautiful point, Christopher. Thank you for that. Yeah, that so that when we too are in distress, uh, hopefully not being betrayed by uh, or, or close to uh, being executed, but 
um, you know, when when we're going through hard times, that that's that's the context of the Lord's Supper, or the mm -hmm. Eucharist, or communion, you know, whichever term you want to use. I, uh, and, and it's worth noting too, since we were talking about Judas, that Judas participates in this, right? Uh, Jesus breaks uh, the bread, uh, you know, and says, take, eat, this is my body. Uh, he takes the cup, um, you know, one of the many cups of wine in the Seder and says, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, right? including Judas, right? Judas partakes in, in this, um, in this self-giving of Jesus. So I, I think that's worth noting as well. I, I'm always struck anew whenever I, I read this, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Um, how um, odd this, and even offensive this would have been to observant Jews, right? So in, mm -hmm. in, in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Leviticus, uh, but also Genesis, uh, it says that there are many times the command is reiterated, you shall not eat blood, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, uh, an observant Jew can't eat a rare steak or steak tartare or anything like that, right? It's because the blood is the life. The blood is the life of the animal. And you offer the blood back to God who gave that animal life to begin with. So for Jesus to say, this is my blood, right? Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's a really striking and, and probably somewhat uh, offensive <laughs> uh, thing to say to observant Jews, but also a really powerful thing to say, right? That that blood in the Old Testament is the sign of the covenant, right? When, when, um, when God makes a covenant with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai back in Exodus, um, Moses sprinkles them with the blood of the sacrifice, right? Blood blood is uh, a symbol of life, uh, and uh, blood is used to seal covenants. Um, yeah. Well, and within this context as well, we have we would be remiss if we didn't mention the blood of the Passover that's spread over the lintels of the doorposts. So that uh, the angel of death passes over the Israelites because of, the, because of that blood. Yes, exactly. It's a, str a strong resonance here as well. Yeah, thank you. For, of course, of course, that as well. Yeah, the Passover lamb's blood that's that's painted over the lintels of the door. So the angel of death passes by. So mm -hmm. Jesus here is that sacrifice, right? Jesus is the Passover lamb uh, through whose blood um death is averted uh, life is given um mm -hmm. and and the people are freed uh liberated from slavery from oppression yeah and again this is with this idea of jesus's blood it leads us right into good friday into the death of as we said the passover lamb and so that's what we will encounter in our next episode <laughs>